Geneticist Christopher Mason can get us ready to travel the solar system, and when we come back to Earth, he can tell us how we changed. A look at Lost in Space and the Titan ahead on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley, and we are so happy to have Christopher Mason back on the show. Hello, Chris. Hello, great to be back. Thank you. Dr. Mason, all right, get ready for this. He's a professor of physiology and biophysics and computational genomics at the Weill Cornell Medical College. And also, he's got something going on in the Department of Neuroscience because Christopher Mason is practically a superhero. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Clearly you sent your hologram, right? You don't have time for this. Yes, we've got 50 of them around the world. Okay, good. One of them, yes, yeah. <laughs> so Chris, I think you might have a Netflix mole in your lab reporting on all the cool stuff you do because there are two new projects from Netflix that seem like they could have been lifted from your studies. In the film Titan, Sam Worthington undergoes a radical genetic transformation to prepare him for life on Saturn's moon, Titan. You will become enhanced humans, supermen. Most of you will fail. Some people will break during the training. And there's a line from the movie that reads, we're no longer trying to shape planets to our existence. We're changing ourselves to fit the planets. Should the human race start thinking about manipulating our genetic makeup in order to prepare for space travel? I think we've already started, and I think the answer is uh, unequivocally yes, which sounds a bit striking and even terrifying because you think, well, we barely understand physiology and genetics and medicine to begin with. How can we possibly have the hubris to start modifying our DNA? Uh, but we already do uh, undergo a lot of selection. And from an evolutionary perspective, we're putting ourselves under a lot of artificial selection, or we're driving our own evolution, I would actually argue we're the first species to direct our own evolution uh, quite consciously or unconsciously in, in many cases. So we're doing it already to some degree and if we're to send people to faraway planets where the human body is, hasn't had millions of years to evolve there, you're either going to have to uh, help them either you know, physically, uh, pharmacologically, or maybe genetically to survive or you're sending them to uh, a near certain death, so you don't want to do that. So I think we might have to think about it and even uh, plan for it more than we're doing accidentally today. In this film, Titan, they jam like 20,000 right, years right. of evolution into a 90-minute movie, and even I know it's not a good idea to rewrite a human being's genetic code over, you know, the course of a summer or, or vacation. Or cocktail or something. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think is the time frame for a change? What's ideal? So. We've been in this relatively current form for about six million years, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the work since the agricultural revolution has been in the span of say ten thousand years. But if you think about lactose, uh, you know, the genes that can let you process lactose in milk as an adult, that's only been really hundreds of years. It's not been that that far. It's been maybe maybe a thousand years, and so you could actually do a fair amount in a matter of you know five or six generations, say over two or three hundred years. It wouldn't be you know, impossible to think about you know, directing evolution so that people could survive on other planets potentially, but you'd have to do a lot, I think. So in the movie, in preparation for space travel, these fictional scientists immediately start messing around with the soldiers' personal genetics, but your lab is suggesting a three-pronged plan that addresses changes to our microbiome, plus changes to our DNA repair mechanism before going full sci-fi on the mm -hmm. human genome. Right. All right, so <laughs> let's break that down. Because I just said a lot of stuff like I knew what it meant. <laughs> what is a microbiome and how do we change it? All right, I'll start with the first. So the microbiome is the collection of all the organisms that are in you and on you that are just not human. So this could be bacteria, viruses, some fungal species that are in and on and on us all, all the time and we exchange them every time we shake hands, every time you grab a subway pole, you exchange a little bit of your microbiome with the environment. But most of it does. Just the word <laughs> subway pull freak me out. Because <laughs> when you have kids, you're like, no, slow motion, don't touch My that. daughter once licked the subway pull. No. And I, I know. Oh, I my know. gosh. <laughs> and you start a whole lab to I cure did, her. To, to figure this out. <laughs> so, the, but the microbiome is just anything that's not human. Interestingly, there's probably a, more microbial cells in your body than human cells. So 
in the democracy of your body, you're a minority party as a human. Uh, so there's actually there's a lot of bacteria. Most of it's your skin and your GI tract full of these bacteria. But microbes. some, I guess many, most have to be good because yeah, oh, we're all here yes, and functioning. Oh, uh, majority of them are commensals, which generally are you know your baseline uh, species that just keep you relatively healthy. They often uh, make drugs or process drugs for you in your gut. And generally, you know, we, we, if every time you digest food, they're also helping in a large degree. And so that's another uh, case where you can see the selection uh, showing up in the human genome and also in the microbiome is that the food that we eat today is, is changed both, actually. So the, the three-pronged approach, you first have to look at the microbiome, all the species that make us a person, uh, which is not just human, but all the species together, and think about can you engineer them to maybe keep you safe. So in yeah. space, there's no showers. So if you're on a long trip to Titan, for example, maybe you, you, we, we know there's ways you can engineer your skin microbiome so that you don't smell as much, so you don't need to shower as much, you don't even need soap, and you wouldn't even smell. So Let's get that going on <laughs> Earth for summertime. There are some stinky people that would probably benefit from this. There's no doubt about that. But um, we haven't yet installed sprayers on the street corners to just cover them with yeah. microbes. I think that would be met with some resistance. But um, Wouldn't it, it be would cool? Maybe there. you guys are working on this. Is there something for um, for um, skin sunscreen mm -hmm. protection? Uh, like? So not yet, but this is something we've talked about in the plan. I posted on the lab's website is, you know, could we think about ways to protect the skin from radiation or yeah. at least to help the repair go faster when you do get damaged? And that's that's mostly just UV radiation because, you know, for things like galactic rays, they'll shoot right through your body and tear apart your DNA and skin won't help you there. But but for things that are, you know, that hit the skin, we should you know, protect them. So the goal for sending astronauts to far, far away is to protect them in as many ways as we can, you know, physically, pharmacologically and genetically. So that's the microbiome. Mm -hmm. What is DNA repair mechanism? So every time, actually every day, you get mutations. We're all mutants, uh, you know, some uh, more mutated than others. Everyone has mutations that arise every day. Almost all of them are repaired, 99.999% of all your mutations just from the sun, from every time your cells copy themselves, they make small mistakes. But it's almost all repaired. Uh, but if you have a three billion letter genome, then even a few mistakes, 0.001% uh, will add up over time. So we all carry mutations and just eventually these will lead to genetic d d dysregulation or epigenetic, which is how genes are packaged and controlled, essentially the, the changes to the DNA that are chemical changes. All these things, you know, they slowly uh, degrade over time. And so what you would want to do is figure out ways to, to maintain better integrity of the DNA. So it's like having a photocopier that makes mistakes all the time. So what if we make a better photocopier and so make it so it's more robust. And so then if you do get damage or if you have any just normal mistakes, that they don't show up and that they get fixed. That all sounds great, but how? What is it, what is the DNA repair mechanism? So we know some of the genes that are uh, scanning DNA. So you can actually you know see DNA right here behind you. Basically, certain uh, molecular machines that go and scan the DNA to look for breaks and changes. So you uh, improve those enzymes. You could add more of them, or you could add additional ones potentially from other species. So. There are certain species of bacteria that actually can survive even in cooling waters of nuclear power plants, and they're just hanging out like it's on uh, you know, the beach in Miami, and they're fine. So we could learn from those extremophiles to understand our own genome better. Does that stifle evolution? Mm. It, it, if, if your body's not fixing itself or changing itself? It's so good, you know, the, it's a great question because if you start to tinker with evolution, again, which I think we're already doing, if you start to more uh, distinctly tinker with evolution, it assumes that you know what you're doing. And, and there's no way we can know everything, or really about anything, uh, but certainly about uh, biology and how the forces of evolution will, uh, will change and what will become next. But uh, I think if you want to create more mutations, you could do that. If you want less mutations, you could do that. But we, uh, we are already putting the genome under selection by, the, by culture, by the things we do, by the way we live our lives. And so if, if we're at least monitoring it, we can hopefully uh, improve it. Maybe not here, because if something goes wrong, you might be worried. What if uh, the whole planet uh, gets destroyed because we do something wrong, or like in, in the movie, uh, that, that could happen. So if you, someone's on another planet and they've been altered with, in theory, you have a whole built-in planetary containment protocol already in place. So. Uh, that's that's in some some ways a benefit of sending the altered humans to another planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this doesn't work out. <laughs> See you guys. <laughs> like we'll have to go to switch to the other planet. Um, Just text us. Know, I say it somewhat jokingly, but also kind of serious. It is um, you know if you have if you tinker with evolution, you have to be extremely careful. You have to do it slowly, cautiously. Do it one step at a time often with a quarantine built in. So most of the genetic engineering that's done now with CRISPR and gene drives, basically these technologies that let you tinker with evolution, are done in very controlled settings, one at a time, and very slowly. So.
Netflix is also rebooting Lost in Space. The original 1965 TV series story was based on the 1812 German novel Swiss Family Robinson, which author Johann David Weiss said was inspired by Daniel Defoe's novel Robinson Crusoe. All right, so we know that Netflix did not get that story from your lab. But while Titan is about humans changing in preparation for space travel, Lost in Space is about how space changes the people who travel through it. And that, Chris, is happening in your lab right now. So you have astronaut Scott Kelly mm -hmm. and his identical twin brother, Mark Kelly. What have you, you're working with them. Yes. Uh, what have you discovered about how space travel changes us genetically? It was a great uh, chance to look at nature versus nurture. This well, question. clearly, when you go into space, one of you grows a mustache and one <laughs> right, of you does right, not. Right. It's the, there's a mustache gene, it pops up, and you just, <laughs> it springs up right away. The, so you can see, I mean, it's a classic twin problem. They always want to have some differenti <laughs> differentiation. But we uh, observed you know, fireworks in space in terms of the number of genes that became activated, all the changes that happened in the body. And, and we're just in the, in the process now of probably releasing this later this year, so. Can you give us a little scoop? So, yes. So first of all, but the brothers, the Kelly brothers are both astronauts? Uh, yes, yes, so they both have been, uh, and Scott's been in space about 10 times longer than Mark, so about 540 days total. And this last mission was 340 days, the one-year mission that, that we worked on uh, with NASA. How is Scott different than Mark? Uh, so he, obviously they have the same uh, DNA, but we did observe uh, some changes to his DNA when he was in space. So one of them that was with Susan Bailey was we could see the telomeres got longer. What uh, are telomeres? Uh, oh, so basically, if you have your shoelaces, and you think of your shoelaces being like your DNA, where you keep all your DNA together in your cells, the telomeres are at the very end that keep things together. And so normally as you get older, they just slowly shrink over time. It's kind of inevitable and inexorable march towards cellular oblivion is what I tell the medical students, which I think is funny. That's uh, because they're younger, but the older people don't like that as much. Um, but anyway, ah, medical over, <laughs> uh, 22 year olds. Um, but if you're, as you get older, they shrink actually, because every time a cell divides, it gets a little bit of damage and, and they get smaller. But in space, uh, his telomeres got longer, which was surprising to see. And so, Does that predict that he would live longer? Uh, well, except that when he came back to Earth, they, they shrunk back down. Oh, again. So it was wait, only how, did you, how did you study him while he's in space? So how we, do you know about telomeres in space? We worked with NASA to actually get the samples. He would draw blood on the space station, plop it in the Soyuz, close the hatch, it would be dropped back down to Kazakhstan, and then repatriate. Wait, 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 you're just glossing. So, <laughs> so he puts, he takes his blood, and puts it in the hatch. This makes me think of those, how you do bank deposits right. at a drive-thru bank. It was bank. like a space station bank deposit that uh, got brought down it, in the Soyuz. How does it get brought down? Uh, in, the, in the Soyuz capsule, so then uh, the, the Russian capsule, the Russian, you know, basically spacecraft. The sample, and it has to be repatriated, so brought back to, it's a word I've never used until the study, a repatriation of the sample, lands in Houston, then we spin down the sample, get the cells out, and then we can look at the telomeres. And is that all you guys collected from Scott Kelly while he was in space, or was he sending down urine samples, sperm samples, yeah. spitting? Uh, we got every, so uh, microbiome samples, which is does require uh, stool samples, so we did have to collect stool, which is hard in zero gravity. Uh, <laughs> s saliva samples. <laughs> I guess There's so. a vacuum involved, that's, that's all you need to know, but it, there's stool Wait, samples. Wait, I'm sorry, I have to ask. When you're in space, do you usually not poop? Uh, no, they don't poop as much, they don't eat as much. Uh, generally, it's because they don't like using the bathroom, so they don't even drink that much water either because it's an entire process that takes about 15, 20 minutes to set up the vacuum pump, get a seal, uh, get things attached, and then make sure that you don't float away, and then make sure that things don't float away. So it's an uh, yeah. involved process. I, we heard that when a poop escapes in space, they call it a runner. Right, right. And, it, and it often escapes, and then you won't see it for sometimes a year and then it'll <laughs> pop back out again later in someone else's mission and you'll be like I think that was from Scott and you can see it come out so there's all these stories of astronauts who just you know you find things six months sometimes a year or two later when someone lost a key lost a piece of uh, tissue if you will yeah so things get lost they, it happens uh, okay but you know it's a little ecosystem up there and uh, so we studied yeah blood uh, saliva stool samples everything we could about what happens to the body and then uh, basically saw that his DNA did change a little bit, so his telomeres got longer, and then it went back down. We saw also some genes that changed expression in space, so when genes get activated, turned on and turned off, some that were in space were still activated even when he came back to Like Earth. what? Uh, so a lot of them genes actually involved in DNA repair and his immune system response, and so we think Like that, thumbs up? Like, like, like good repair? So right now we, we don't know. We know that they're more activated, but we don't know if it's because they're stressed or if they're just active and actually functional. So we, we think it might, we, I can't say yet if it's good or bad. We just know they've changed. And so 
what we want to wait and see is well, what happens to him over the next five, ten years? Does he, he generally appear healthy? Is his immune system functioning? So far, we think it's um, you know not good or bad, but because we've never done this before to a, an astronaut, we don't we've never measured billions of molecules at the same time before and after a space flight, and never for more more than uh, six months. Did Scott Kelly come back taller or shorter? Uh, so he was a little bit taller. He did come back, uh, came back a little bit over an inch taller, but that also goes away within like an hour of being back on Earth. So to this terrestrial life totally sucks, frankly. Uh, it, it shrinks you. Your telomeres go back to you know come back down. Uh, you have these huge spikes in a lot of the response in the body to stress or immune function, uh, which also goes away. He, he had said when he got back, his skin felt like it was on fire when he got back from from the stress. What about I, I want to? What about emotional? Did, did you guys measure like serotonin levels, vasopressin, that kind of stuff? Cortisol levels were higher, and so also we saw um, cortisol levels higher in in in, in space. In space, uh, for Scott, a little bit at the beginning, and then they came down actually, and so. We compared him to other astronauts. He's actually relatively, he's cool as a cucumber as far as the astronauts go. So other ones were much higher in terms of their cortisol and stress levels. And he spiked when he got up there because you did just get into space. Uh, but then it actually flattened pretty quickly. So he was a uh, relatively cool customer. But we did see, you know, he was traveling closer to the speed of light. So we could see he actually gained 0.1 seconds through Einstein's relativity because he was going, you know, essentially around the Earth, uh, you know, at, at 40,000 miles an hour. So he was going pretty fast. And uh, we did see so that. So he's 0.1 seconds older than his brother now? Or younger, yeah, because younger. He, went, he went closer towards the speed of light. So we do have a little bit of relativity and a little sense of what happens to the body uh, in these long term missions. All right, let's talk a little bit about earthbound changes. Mm -hmm. The 1984 classic Miyazaki film Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind takes place in a post apocalyptic world where toxic jungles are encroaching on the few clean patches of land where humans can still live. And the big reveal, and okay, this is a film from 1984, so I am going to tell you the ending. The big surprise is that these seemingly toxic jungles are actually cleaning the pollutants out of the earth and air where they spawn. In Miyazaki's fantasy, nature manufactured new organisms to save itself. Now, Chris, wouldn't that be nice if something like that could happen on Earth, say, in the extremely polluted Gowanus Canal? Uh, yes, which is right next to us in Brooklyn, so I don't live that far away. There's also some great uh, breweries popping up near this polluted canal, so it could lead to inspiration in many ways. Uh, we, so we've been studying some of the strange organisms that still survive in the Gowanus Canal, which is a Superfund site. So it's an EPA-designated Superfund site. It means it's so polluted that there's dedicated national resources to clean it up. And Whoa. So, so that's F-U-N-D, not uh, Superfund. Yeah, yeah, not Superfund. Okay. Superfund, right, is an important distinction. And it's, um, you, you know, if you swim in there, you would likely, uh, uh, you know, and, and basically be absorbing a lot of toxic chemicals. And you'd have microbiomes out the yin-yang, yeah, right? Yeah, it would be a big change, your microbiome. Okay. Uh, the other interesting thing is that we have sequenced it and actually seen what's growing in there. We see interesting species of Pseudomonas putida, which is this one species that seems to be surviving actually quite well there. And interestingly, we can see all these pathways, the, basically these uh, cellular mechanisms that can digest things like toluene or petrol are activated and, and present in these species. So they actually have almost slowly become the beneficiaries of their own selection, their own evolution to survive in this toxic place. Wait, okay, so just so I understand, you found new biological organisms in the Gowanus Canal that are cleaning the canal? That were the they're, they're surviving by eating up all the bad stuff? Eating up the garbage. So it's actually, it's just like that story, but now happening here in Brooklyn. So we're actually, the organisms, if you put organisms under enough stress sometimes, they can actually evolve and then end up even in a toxic environment, uh, maybe doing okay and even uh, digesting it. Yeah. This is so hopeful, even, I mean, literally and as a metaphor, right? Because yeah, yeah. it's a fine mess we humans have gotten ourselves in. I mean, this makes me, remember the old commercial, there's like scrubbing bubbles? Yes. So, right, so they're, you can sit back, they're kind of doing the action for you? Yeah, yeah. and actually we uh, had an art project as well to install, which should basically memorialize these, because right now they're going to clean up the canal. But if you think about it, they're a unique genetic catalog of these survivors that have a way to clean up waste. So we've actually been banking the samples and also depositing these sequences to say, here is here are the survivors we can't forget about them because when you clean it all up you'll lose that information of what was able to actually persist and survive and be resilient in the first place. You're saving these uh, Pseudomonas petita. Mm -hmm. Could you unleash them on like the next sadly inevitable oil spill? Uh, th this has been described even since the 1980s. Can we engineer bacteria to eat oil? Uh, Shakur Bharti was a famous person who th did this. Th this actually led to a Supreme Court case which was asked the question of, can you patent uh, life, an organism, 
And the answer so far is very much yes. If you engineer a new organism that's never existed before, you should get a high five and a pat on the back and you get a patent because you made something new. It, did never, exist, it never existed before, so uh, you've invented something. It just happens to be life. It seems like in a, a city, like especially a city like New York, everything has already been discovered. I mean, that there would be no new organisms ever, but that's not the case? Oh, not at all. Actually, we've been sequencing uh, many subway, uh, actually, we've sequenced every single subway station, what's on the surfaces across New York City, and we're doing this in 75 other cities around the world. And on average, every time you touch a surface, about 50% of the DNA in the subway has never been seen until we've sequenced it and actually looked at it. So this uh, represents this entire- Is that you? Oh, the, that's me swabbing, enjoying my swabbing there. And this is a, an ongoing uh, genetic discovery effort that we're doing around the world. It's a big project called Metasub, which is the metagenomics of subways and urban biomes. To what end? So, so why do this outside of the uh, pleasure Disgusting and, and joy of, of uh, swabbing things? Uh, we call them swab ventures. We're swab maniacs. There's a lot of swab festivals that we have, as you can see here in this picture. The, the, the goals are really to map what's there, which we've already seen half of it we have never seen before, so it's a di discovery effort. We can also track antibiotic resistance and see that actually in the sequence data, and you can even mine this data to find new drugs. So it turns out that a lot of bacteria are fighting antibiotics with, with making new ant antibiotics that you can see in their, in their genetic code. And you can also see what else they're making that gives you actually a way to find and then validate entirely new antibiotics at the same time. So everything we've talked about today is basically how something changes on a genetic level so it can survive or thrive. Mm -hmm. And your lab takes all of this information and applies it to cancer, is that uh, right? We do, it seems like they're not related. It seems like how can you take genetic engineering and, and microbes in the subway and apply it to cancer? But the forces of evolution are present in all these areas of life. And also what we've really learned more recently about cancer is that some of the same drivers of cancer we see uh, as a model of what we see in bacterial evolution, that how things evolve are very relevant. Doesn't but, cancer just live to reproduce itself? Reproduce. Isn't that the essence of it? Yeah, and, re and resists and then also yeah. learns to survive, just like bacteria do in microbes. And even more interesting is as we sequence the DNA of more cancers, we actually find microbes sometimes inside of cancers or being driven by viruses or bacteria in some cases. So a notable example is HPV and cervical cancer, uh, which is now a vaccine for, but it can also cause some throat cancer. Or you think of hepatitis C and liver cancer. So sometimes the viruses can drive the cancer or Heliobacter pylori and a stomach cancer. So we know that there's a, a really tight link between inflammation from infections and the cancer. And sometimes you can even see bacteria in the cancer. That, so first you have to treat with antibiotics to get rid of the bacteria, and then you treat with chemotherapy, and only then will that be successful. So it's really a merger of two historically very different fields are now coming together. What's the 500 year plan? So, I will, uh, so I'll be dead for the majority of my 500 year plan. I posted the, uh, up on the lab's website in 2011 because we were looking at these, these species of bacteria that could survive in nuclear power plants to learn from them. And I, th I, said, I was thinking, I said, well, we need a, a plan for all this work. So let's, I drafted it, put it up on the, on the website and said, here's the, the plan for the lab. We want to be able to understand human biology and, and the microbial biology well enough uh, so that we can actually begin to engineer it. So that is uh, in the first 50 years of the plan, this is which, which is when at some point I'll die, uh, so I'll be gone for most of it. But we will have established the fundamentals needed to uh, really look at the human genome and our microbial buddies and engineer them so that we can actually begin to go to potentially Mars or farther places. So the first 50 years is mostly discovery and the beginning of testing. The, the second really 150 to 200 years is when you start to begin to put people on Mars for long periods of time. And then I think towards the, the latter half of the last 250 years is more when you're actually thinking about Titan, actually. So this is uh, interesting. There may have been a mole in the lab who, who pitched this to Netflix. I don't know. But it was something we talked about uh, really uh, in five years ago, so six years ago almost. So, Chris, this is what always, I always found, find remarkable and admirable about scientists is this, um, I guess, sanguinity about knowing that what you're devoting your life to you will never have the answers in your lifetime or have very, very few. So you've got a 500-year plan. Yes. Uh, what, if, if you could flash forward or urgently solve something now, like what do you yearn, yearn to know more than anything else with all the things you're studying? Hmm. Interesting. The thing, the, the, thing, actually, the, the thing I would like you know, more than anything else is actually um, not one thing out of all of those things that we study in the lab because they're all interrelated, but more to have um, actually some way to translate that so that everyone would have 
a 500 year plan actually or, or some concept that would live beyond your own life and so this is children is a good example people have kids they think that's going to go obviously beyond their own life in most cases but I think uh, to be human is to have an innate capacity that as far as we know is unique amongst all organisms to think beyond your own life and even plan for it so I yeah. my only thing I would like is to have actually uh, other people uh, really deeply care about people they'll never meet and so most people at NASA do this uh, most people do this when you give to charities for example but uh, it's not ingrained in people, and, and they certainly don't think about it really more than a, a few months or years at a time. And so I, or tribally, I, like you said, about their own offspring okay. specifically, which, which is still very uh, really uh, insular. And so you, uh, what I would love is for uh, you know the capacity of, of everyone that's human to be used to its fullest. Which uh, one of them that's the, one of the most unique things about people is that capacity to look decades or even centuries out to the future. Uh, and so I think uh, that's what I'd love more is that people thinking about uh, like. The movies help because the Titan gets people thinking about it yeah. and imagining it. So yeah. usually something goes wrong and the geneticist is usually evil uh, or the military, something goes wrong. But um, even thinking about it and imagining it uh, is, a, is a good exercise. And so I think the more that that happens uh, prepares us to be, uh, I think, what we really can be as a species, which is more than just on one planet, but uh, uh, really going many planets. That's a gorgeous, lofty spin on the importance of some pop culture right. and, and, and the use of our, I, so. I mean, we, we yeah. think of the important work you do, but it's nice to think of the arts and creativity and imagination to be working in concert with you to make us care about, about humans we'll never meet. Yes, yeah, ho hopefully. And, it's, uh, and also some good uh, graphics and CGI also help. Yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us. You have a remarkable talent for taking things that sound, that seem very confusing and, and uh, esoteric and making them meaningful. Well, thanks, pleasure. Well, it's so wonderful to be here. Uh, thanks. Thank you.